higher Medicare levy to fund peacekeeping role in East Timor. Petrol set for a pre-Christmas price jump and Susie Moroni swims again despite medical concerns. From National 9 News, this is Nightline with Hugh Rimmington. Good evening. The Prime Minister has won broad political support for his plan to levy a special tax to pay for Australia's peacekeeping role in East Timor. People on higher incomes will be hit with a 12-month increase in the Medicare levy. Mr Howard says the alternatives, a cut in government spending or a budget in deficit, were simply unacceptable. Laurie Wilson has our report. It was always going to be an expensive exercise. The government estimates around $3 billion over the next three years to keep our peacekeepers in East Timor, enough to blow a large hole in next year's budget and turn an expected surplus into a half a billion dollar deficit. The government, Mr Speaker, is not willing for this to occur. The days of budget deficits should remain firmly behind us. Having successfully funded the guns buyback program with a temporary increase in the Medicare levy three years ago, the government has now opted for the same strategy to cover the cost of East Timor. Taxpayers earning more than $50,000 a year will face a 12-month increase in the levy from next July, a rise of half a percent for those earning between fifty dollars and $100,000 a year, a 1% increase for people on more than $100,000. The only alternative to this special and temporary levy would be further cuts in government spending. The extra funds will also be used to boost defence numbers, an additional 3,000 soldiers and 500 Air Force personnel. This increase is required to sustain Australia's involvement in the peacekeeping operation and to maintain acceptable levels of overall defence readiness. Both Labor and the Democrats support the decision. The mechanism that has been put forward, I would say, is about as fair a way as you could contemplate. With higher income earners set to receive substantial personal income tax cuts next year, Meg Lee says it's only appropriate that they should pick up the tab. Remember, they still will be getting tax cuts. And indeed, they'll be reduced less than $10 a week. So I think that we are doing it the fairest way possible. By easing the pressure on the budget, the government has also potentially paved the way for the passage of its business tax reforms. Meg Lee still wants some changes, but she is ready to deal. Changing the capital gains tax uh, section of the package with one or two other measures is probably going to be pretty close to what we now need. Laurie Wilson reporting for Nightline. An inquiry into a fatal clash on the border of East and West Timor last month has found Australian troops were in the wrong. A joint Australian and Indonesian inquiry has confirmed the Australian troops had strayed into Indonesian territory when shooting broke out, but that inaccurate maps were to blame. The inquiry found an overreaction by Indonesian troops contributed to the incident, which left one of their policemen dead. Meanwhile, America's UN ambassador Richard Holbrook has been greeted warmly by East Timor's independence leaders, Bishop Carlos Bello and Janana Guzmao. Mr Holbrook told them officially of the new agreement with Indonesia for the repatriation of refugees from West Timor. There's nothing slow about the trickle-down effect in the oil business. A rise in prices on the world market will mean a swift increase at Australian pumps, as much as three cents a litre by Christmas. It's no longer a question of if, but when. Within weeks, petrol prices are expected to rise, a flow-on of the jump in the world crude oil price. In New York this morning, it climbed to $41 a barrel. That's the highest level since the 91 Gulf War. Just a year ago, it was less than half that, at around $18 a barrel. If world oil prices do remain high, it is likely that we will see an increase at the petrol pump of a few cents a litre, and we could be talking of two to three cents at the petrol pump. Most are blaming OPEC for cutting back supplies. Also, there's Iraq's decision to slash back production as it pushes for an end to UN sanctions. We can only hope that some OPEC countries actually break ranks and uh, continue to increase production. And today, a pat on the back for the oil companies from the Consumer and Competition Commission. The study of prices between January and August showed they rose around 1.8 cents a litre, less than expected given the full effect of world prices. 
Despite a price rise in the short term, some oil industry analysts say the current high cost of crude is unsustainable and should fall probably by the second quarter of next year. Whether any drop in price is passed on to consumers is a different matter. Mark Burrows reporting for Nightline. Sydney Olympic organisers today continued the task of trying to rebuild public confidence shattered by the Games ticketing fiasco. After making changes to the structure of the ticketing committee, Olympics Minister Michael Knight says it's time to move on. The state opposition, though, says it's the minister himself who should be moving on. Thank you. Michael Knight agreed to front the parliamentary inquiry into the ticket debacle to explain how changes adopted by the board will ensure it doesn't happen again. To set in place the structural things and the changes we need to let us move forward and not repeat the ticketing problems. Ticketing manager Paul Reading has been stripped of that role and Chief Executive Sandy Holway gets a new deputy with whom he can share the workload. But one of the committee's first questions, considering an independent auditor's criticism of SOCOG's ticketing arrangements, why wasn't anyone sacked? Nor do I believe that it is appropriate to single out scapegoats and offer them up as some sort of public sacrifice in the process. But that hasn't satisfied the New South Wales opposition, which has called on the Premier to dump Mr Knight as President of SOCOL. There needs to be a change and a change at the top. Mr Knight says that won't be happening. There's no point crying over spilt milk. We have to fix the ticketing process in-house now. Raymond Dale for Nightline. Victorian Premier Steve Brax has attacked his predecessor Jeff Kennett over what the new Premier is describing as tainted tendering for Melbourne's casino. In Parliament today, Mr Brax released documents that were suppressed by the Kennett government, claiming Crown could have been unfairly helped in its bid for the casino licence. He accused Mr Kennett of lying about his knowledge of the competing bids, saying that in 1993 the government had a complete analysis of all bids before Crown increased its offer. But former Gaming Minister Roger Hallam insists the tender process was above board and the documents prove nothing. The Broadcasting Authority, still examining Sydney's 2UE, will investigate Melbourne's top talk station, 3AW, and its drive time announcer, now Steve Price. Apparently acting on secret allegations, the ABA will look particularly at any commercial dealings with Crown Casino, Volvo or the road constructor Transurban. Both Steve Price and the station management say they have nothing to hide. Meanwhile, another blow for 2UE tonight, losing its right to broadcast rugby league next season. The football has been a big ratings winner for the station, but rival 2GB has secured exclusive commercial coverage with the richest radio contract in the code's history. After sinking emotionally in recent weeks, Susie Moroni was today back doing what she does best, swimming and raising money for charity. Putting aside her recent emotional breakdown and drink driving charge, she took to Canberra's Lake Burley Griffin. Back in the swim against all advice, Susie Moroni doing what she does best. Less than four weeks after her humiliating breakdown, the marathon swimmer was at it again, plunging into Canberra's Lake Burley Griffin for charity. Before she left dry land, a nervous Susie spoke frankly about her personal ordeal. Yeah, I feel okay. I'm, I'm still a bit kind of fragile. Unlike her marathon swims, today's outing was a quick dip. This will be Susie's last swim until well into next year. She now plans to take a much needed break before she starts training again in February. Along for the ride, brother Sean and deputy opposition leader Simon Crean. After half an hour, Susie was pulled from the chilly lake with a wave of relief. The long distance legend already planning her comeback. I'll be around Cuba again. I love that area and it's warm water. Flowbitcon for Nightline. After the break, the mum who rescued her sons then gave birth to another boy and the pilots who tell of their struggle to escape their sinking plane. South Australian police have recaptured two convicted murderers who escaped yesterday from Mobilong Prison east of Adelaide. Police dogs flushed them out of bush country near the Murray River. Earlier, workers had spotted Henrik Willemsen and Gary Shaw hiding in a makeshift shelter. Dozens of heavily armed officers swooped on the area. The pair gave themselves up without a struggle. 
The men's prison break went unnoticed for almost an hour, despite an activated alarm and video surveillance. They're expected to face court tomorrow. An English tourist who'll need medical treatment for the rest of his life is to receive $6.5 million in damages over a Gold Coast road accident. Nathan Perry, a pillion passenger on a friend's motorcycle, suffered serious brain damage in a collision with a car in 1993. Mr Perry was in a coma for months. He still has no movement in his right side and effectively cannot speak. Insurers for both the driver and rider settled for a Queensland record amount. The case was due to go to court next week. The internet has opened up a technological treasure trove for many people, but there's concern about a growing gulf between the computer haves and have-nots. With that in mind, the ACTU and Big Business have joined forces to give more than 2 million Australian Union members a chance to log on to the information age with cheap computers and internet access. It seems like they're everywhere, but more than half Australian homes are still without computers and 84% don't have internet access because of the initial cost and difficulty of setup. In a clever marketing deal with IBM and Primus Telecom, Virtual Communities is selling a computer delivered to the home, hooked up to the internet and training for around $10 a week over three and a half years. You know, it's setting our budget, otherwise we wouldn't be able to afford a computer outright. Initially, the deal is being offered exclusively to Australia's 2 million unionists and 400,000 members of the Australian Retirement Fund, which is a key investor. While seeing the potential to combat declining membership, the ACTU is keen to empower working class people. Something unfair was happening, that the people we represented were missing out on the opportunities that were available to those at the top end of the income scale. Natasha Johnson for Nightline. The two Australians forced to ditch their plane in the Pacific on a flight from the US mainland to Hawaii are back safely on dry land. They admit they're lucky to be telling the tale, which for the first time they did today. Very, very lucky. That's how the United States Coast Guard described the two Australian flyers who today arrived on a rescue boat in Hawaii in good condition, despite spending 10 hours in a churning sea. We lost all our landing lights, all the landing yeah. lights, everything had gone. 63-year-old Raymond Clamback flies New Light planes from America to Australia for a living. He's made the trip 150 times. Today, along with his co-pilot Shane Wiley, a Sydney pathologist who tagged along for the adventure, they explained how things only got worse when they tried to get out while the plane was sinking. Unfortunately, the life raft didn't inflate, and so we spent the next 10 hours in water with the jackets on only. And, uh, I've used every muscle, I think, in my body that I haven't used for 40 years. Luckily, a Coast Guard plane using night scopes found them in the dark and called in this tanker to pick them up. Clamback, the veteran flyer, intends to return immediately to ferrying little planes with little engines from America, while his friend Shane Wiley won't be tempting fate too soon because he remembers only too well what he was saying out there in the dark in the middle of the Pacific. I said, Ray, you bastard, for talking me into this. <laughs> Robert Penfold reporting for Nightline. Meanwhile, the Egypt air disaster has stirred fresh calls for video cameras to be installed in the cockpits of passenger jets. Aviation experts say the devices could be linked to the cockpit voice recorder to enable investigators in the event of a crash to see what was happening on the flight deck. There's been strong speculation that the crash of flight 990 last month, in which 217 people died, was caused by a suicidal co-pilot. The fallout continues for British author Geoffrey Archer after claims he fabricated an alibi in a libel case. The Conservative Party has sacked him as whip and withdrawn his right to sit in the House of Lords. Archer withdrew from the London Lord Mayoral race this week after admitting he had a friend testify they were together the night Archer was actually dining with a female acquaintance. Archer had not wanted the liaison revealed during a libel trial against a newspaper which had accused him of having sex with a prostitute. The newspapers demanding the return of the libel payout, costs and interest, all up more than $7 million. In London, billionaire Mohammed Al-Fayed has repeated his claim that Prince Philip masterminded the deaths of Princess Diana and his son Dodie. The owner of Harrods department store was speaking during a libel trial brought against him by former Tory politician Neil Hamilton. 
Mr Al Fayed claimed Dodi and Diana were engaged and that Prince Philip conspired with Britain's Secret Service to kill the couple to stop what he says would have been a controversial marriage. A young Victorian mother had her hands full today. Joanna Greenaway had to drag her two sons from a burning car after it smashed into a tree. Soon after, she presented them with a new baby brother. For Joanne Greenaway, the day began like any other, but by early afternoon, the young mum had saved four lives and given birth. This is what remains of the car she and her sons, six-year-old Edward and three-year-old William, were travelling in to meet the school bus. I'm not sure what happened. I lost control of the car and skidded and tried to correct and must have overcorrected and then all of a sudden we were into the tree. The accident happened on a road Joanne says she's repeatedly asked the local council to seal. With all three inside, smoke and flames began pouring from the engine. I had to get them both out. So um, um, which one did you get out first? I think I got you out first because you were in the front and that was where the fire was. Moments later, the car exploded, but not before Joanne and the boys were well clear. Both William's legs were broken and Edward had a broken arm and burns to the face. They were picked up by the school bus and taken to hospital, just in time for the birth of Joanne's new son. Nicholas Greenaway arrived two weeks premature, but very healthy. Susie Calder for Nightline. In a moment, footing the bill for East Timor, Paul Lynham talks with the Prime Minister. Prime Minister John Howard is refuting claims that leaked intelligence reports indicate Australia could have forestalled the violence that erupted in East Timor after the independence vote. Mr Howard is also defending the special tax that will help pay for Australia's peacekeeping effort. In Canberra, Mr Howard is with Paul Liner. Prime Minister, welcome again to Nightline. Good to be here. Are Australian taxpayers having to pay for the fact that you and your ministers ignored the intelligence briefs that warned of looming violence and destruction in East Timor? No, that's ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. There was no way Australia could have gone in before Indonesia agreed without invading the country, and only a fool would have advocated an invasion. I mean, this is old ground. This is rehashing a, an old argument. Still that the documents no, pop up, don't well, they? Well, documents another always pop today. up. You know what this place is like, documents pop up the whole time. But the Australian public knows very well that if we had tried to go in against Indonesia's wishes, we would have been invading that country. And that would have been about as reckless an act that any Australian government could have undertaken. Meanwhile, though, we've now discovered that, for example, some of the militia were hacking the limbs off children. But, Paul, that's the reason why we went in. So now Australian taxpayers find $900 million next year. Yeah, those who earn over $50,000 a year, $900 million for one year only. To help East Timor to help pay for our defence effort in East Timor. While at the same time we're giving $120 million to Indonesia in foreign aid. In the long run it is of use to Australia to have a prosperous Indonesia because 211 million people living in greater prosperity can buy more from this country. You cut off your nose to spite your face if you try and enfeeble a country next door to us that has 211 million people. And there were no other savings that could have been made before you thought of imposing this levy? Well, you could have cut into essential areas of social welfare spending, but we're not going to do that. I mean, we, we run a very tight ship as far as spending is concerned. We support all the necessary areas like health and education and social support for the needy. We've cut a lot of the fat out. And to say to people earning over $50,000 a year, I mean, a bloke on $60,000 next year will get a $62 a week tax cut under our tax plan. Because of this levy, that $62 a week will fall to 56. Now, everybody under 50,000 is, is untouched by this. Yeah, but everything he buys, you pay the GST on. There's the other side of the equation. Yes, but, but they're still in net terms a lot better off. Paul. We've been through this before, and you've seen all the cameos. But everybody under 50,000 is untouched. 
that's 80 per cent of taxpayers and I repeat this is only going on for one year like the gun levy that went on for one year and it came off at the end of the 12 months period no if buts or maybes but given that things are so tight it does look as though the Democrats and Labor have been justified in their concerns that the business tax changes do not become a drain on the public purse. Well, they're not going to be a drain on the public purse. Well, there's a lot of expert evidence to suggest well, to the well, contrary. Well, let, let, let that play itself out, but the whole basis of, uh, of that proposition is that it is and will remain revenue neutral. I mean, the Treasurer has made that very clear. Uh, I think you'll find a good outcome on that, but we're still working on it. So now you're looking for 3,000 more soldiers and 500 more airmen. Mm. To do what exactly? Well, we're building up to full strength uh, two additional battalions so that we will maintain a capacity to service our East Timor uh, commitment, but also be in a position to cover any other contingencies that might arise. Such as? Well, we don't know, do we? I mean, this is the sort of world we live in. The reason why we have a special levy is that at the time of the last budget, we had no reason to believe that we'd have to shell out an additional one billion dollars uh, in the coming financial year. I mean, that's why we've got this special levy. Do you regret, though, disbanding the Ready Reserve no, back in I February 1997? <coughs> no, I don't. Why not? Don't. Well, I tell you why. Because the the Ready Reserves were were costing, on a per capita basis, 65 percent of the cost of maintaining a regular soldier yet the ready reservists were only available for a limited period each year. It wasn't a good investment. It's far better to have a general reserve. And the recruitment rate for the general res from the general reservists over the last uh, few uh, uh, months, particularly in the wake of East Timor, uh, for service in their ordinary units has been very good. Prime Minister, thanks for your time. Pleasure. Hugh, back to you. Thanks, Paul. In a moment, all the latest sport with Amanda to pledge and Amanda, Greg Norman, determined to climb back to the top of world golf. Hugh, what better place to start for the Shark than this week's Australian Open? Also tonight, the new logo for the West Tigers. And Steve Waugh's men now switch their focus to a clean sweep against Pakistan. Good evening. After their historic match-winning partnership against Pakistan in the second cricket test, Justin Langer and Adam Gilchrist have returned home to Western Australia. But there's little time for celebration as they prepare to punish Pakistan again this week. A hero's welcome for the entire Australian cricket team and for two in particular. Winners are grinners and WA's dynamic duo Langer and Gilchrist haven't stopped smiling since this historic moment in Hobart. That is the winning run. 24 hours on, back home, the enormity is just starting to hit home. I think it's great for West Australia because you know, obviously having Gilly and I in the side's a big thing. Langer silencing the critics in the best possible way. Gilchrist's entry to the Test Arena great at the Gabba, brilliant at Bell Reeve. It's not something I'd uh, ever dreamt, so I can't say it's a dream come true really, but it's uh, been a big thrill. Time with family all too short. Two hours later, back to business with the team. Newcomer Brett Lee looking forward to a lively whacker wicket. It's a fast bowl's wicket, so um, if I'm lucky enough to actually get a chance to actually have a bowl, um, it should suit me, yeah, nice and bouncy. Arriving on the same plane virtually unnoticed, the tourists plan to change all that come Friday. Langer looking forward to renewing acquaintances with Pakistani pace man Akhtar. It's going to be another street fight, I think, for the next five days. Bob Hunnett for Nightline. Greg Norman will be hunting his sixth Australian Open title this week at Royal Sydney. No longer troubled by a shoulder injury, the Shark is back in devastating form. Off the leash of shoulder rehabilitation, Norman opened up at Royal Sydney with a massive drive at the first tee in today's Pro-Am. And the way I feel about life and golf in general, that I'll be around for a few more years to come. He delights in the fact that at 44 years of age and following a frustrating recovery from shoulder surgery, the hunger and bite in his game remains. Only last week, he shot a season low 63 in the final round of the Phoenix Open in Japan. I'm not going out to prove that I can do it one more time. I'm going out to because it's the same mandate I've always had playing the golf. I just love to play. On the sensitive issue of Aussie players who fail to support their home tour, Norman trod the diplomatic path. It's, it's none of my business. You know, I really don't step into other people's boundaries uh, because that is a personal choice, a personal decision. 
The non-appearance of good friend Steve Elkington has drawn a lot of flack. The former US PGA champion believes he has never received the respect or full recognition for his achievements down under. Norman agrees about the achievement, but... You have to uh, be visible if you, if you want to get the acknowledgements. Norman plans to increase his playing commitment next season, but how much that will include the Australian tour is unknown. Ken Sutcliffe for Nightline. A new look for a new rugby league team. West Tigers unveiled their logo in Sydney today. A symbol of what all concerned hope will be a long and successful marriage between the former western suburbs and Balmain. Ready to attack in season 99. Armed with an aggressive new logo and a near full playing roster, including key signings Jared McCracken and Terry Hill. When it came to image, the club called on the support of local primary school children. They're our fans, they're our future fans, and we found of the samples that this particular logo received overwhelming support. And that's very important for us. A tense battle for trainers and owners at the barrier draw for Friday night's Miracle Mile in Sydney. The six contenders had to win a high-tech race to decide starting positions. American star Slug of Gin drew wide, while Holmes DG, Breenies Fella and Shattering Lass will have the inside running. And also back on track, champion stayer Might and Power. He's resumed light track work after a career-threatening tendon injury, much to the delight of owner Nick Moratis. I hope to God that he, he gets back because, um, you know, I just think it brings so much tears to your eyes, it's not funny. That is sport for tonight, Hugh. Thank you, Amanda. To Finance News Now, and the Australian share market closed down a shade, about two points today. In Tokyo, the Nikkei was up 251 points. In London tonight, the FTSE is 30 points higher in morning trading. Gold is fetching $296.70 US an ounce. And in European trading tonight, the Aussie dollar is buying 63.7 US cents, 61 euro cents, 66 yen and 39 pence. The national weather and there's cloud activity over Queensland and Central Australia associated with a cold front while a large high is moving through the Bight and into the southeast. The forecasts, showers and storms for Darwin and Brisbane, fine though for Sydney, Canberra, Melbourne, Hobart and Adelaide and for Perth a fine day ahead as well. And that was the day. I'm Hugh Rimmington. Good night.